Hello, I'm Julie Marie Strange, and I'm going to argue for a woman called Frances Kelly um, as my Great Britain. In 2015, the British government introduced the Serious Crimes Act, criminalising coercive and controlling behaviour within intimate or family relationships. Charities and campaigners had long lobbied to get definitions of domestic violence expanded to include insidious and often invisible forms of abuse. But this law owes much to a long forgotten woman who in her mid 60s and having been married for 40 years refused to suffer in silence anymore. In January 1869, Frances Kelly fled her Liverpool home, the home that she shared with her husband, the Reverend James Kelly. She wanted to leave an abusive marriage. The odds were stacked against her. Women in 1860s Britain had very little rights, um, almost no rights to the protection of their person or their property within the context of a marriage. Frances had attempted to leave her marriage before, but English law insisted that unless a wife could prove that a husband had been physically cruel to her, by which I mean enacted physical violence to her person, though this does not include at this time non-consensual sex, she had no grounds for separation. Now, James had never beaten or hit Francis. So within the terms of the law, he had never been cruel to her and Francis was not abused. But here's what James was. James was controlling and James was coercive. He had taken and spent all of Francis's money. He vetted who she could see, who came into the house, where Francis went. He had thrown their 21 year old son out. So this gradual process of increased isolation, he vetted all her correspondence before she sent letters out. He read all the letters that came in. Francis did not have a key to her own front door. James also sacked the housekeeper that had been with Francis for years. In that woman's place, he employed a married couple and on them taking up their posts, he told them directly that actually what he really wanted them to do in their jobs was surveil his wife and report back on a daily basis. After 40 years, Francis found her marriage intolerable. When the new couple arrived to take up their posts, she told them they could surveil her all they wanted. Actually, all Francis longed for was the end of her own life. Now, fortunately, Francis's fury and her despair galvanized into a determination to survive James Kelly and survive her marriage instead. She took an enormous risk. Realising one Sunday morning after James had left to give his sermon in the pulpit to a near empty church because other people found him quite insufferable as well. Francis realised that the new housekeeper had forgotten to lock the door behind him. She seized her moment and she literally just ran. Now, Frances had managed to conceal a small amount of money from James. She took that money, she made it to the train station, and she got on a train to get to her sister who lived in North Wales. Frances was travelling, she hoped, towards a new kind of freedom. When Frances sued for separation from her husband, though, she knew, and her lawyers knew, that within the existing interpretation of the law, she had no grounds for separation. They could not prove that James had been physically cruel to her because James had always been careful not to be. What they could pitch for, however, was for a reinterpretation of the law existing on an expanded definition of cruelty. Here's what they argued. 
They suggested that James was guilty of cruelty because his controlling and coercive behavior, particularly over a sustained period of time, had such a negative impact on Francis's mental health that a physical breakdown in health uh, was inevitable. So this was in a roundabout way, physical cruelty. Now, Reverend James Kelly, in his defense, argued that when a man signs up to the army, he knows what his duty is. He knows that if and when he loses his life, it's part of the course, it's partly what he signed up for. And James Kelly uses this analogy to defend his marriage because he argues that in secular and divine law, when a woman signs up to marriage, she signs up to a duty to live with whatever her husband chooses to inflict on her. She has to obey. That is her duty. And if that costs her her life, well, that's the duty of a wife. Now, what's so horrific and terrifying is that within a strict interpretation of the law, James Kelly was right. And so what Francis is doing is challenging the very premise on which understandings of marriage are grounded. And it's important to say, not all husbands take such an interpretation as this, thank God. But anyway, here we are. James Kelly does, and he uses it in his defense. Both James and Francis know that the stakes of this case are exceptionally high because Francis isn't just arguing about her marriage, she's arguing for a fundamental reinterpretation of the foundation of marriage and divorce law. It is worth noting, however, that if Francis lost this case, the stakes for her would have been incredibly, unthinkably high because the law would have demanded that she had to go back to her husband, and we all know how horrific that would have been for her. So despite lots of warning that the case could potentially set a legal precedent, and after long deliberation, the judge overseeing the case found in Francis's favor. In November, 1869, after 11 months, um, it was 11 months since she left, the home, the family home on that cold Sunday, January morning. Frances Kelly um, was granted legal separation from her husband, James, on the grounds of cruelty. The controlling and coercive behaviour of James Kelly had for the first time been legally defined as cruelty and warranted the legal protection of the wife. So Frances Kelly had taken an extraordinary risk to stand up for the right to live free from abuse and controlling behaviours. Of course, she was privileged in the sense that she did have family who were able to afford to support her and going to the law. And there are still many women who do not have the financial privilege or ability um, to take that action, who are trapped by economic inequalities in miserable marriages and relationships. Nevertheless, in redefining what cruelty within a marriage was, Frances Kelly expanded understandings of domestic violence um, to the benefit of us all. This is where I think we can trace that direct line from Frances Kelly's extraordinary gamble to the 2015 Serious Crimes Act. Now, for a short while after the case, the Reverend James Kelly was um, publicly vilified um, sufficiently that pantomime villains that year uh, were often cast in the character of the cruel cleric. But life moved on, more divorce cases came, and this case has become a mere footnote uh, in the history of larger legislative reforms on family and marriage and domestic violence. Frances Kelly spent her remaining years living with her son, daughter-in-law, and their little boy named Francis after his remarkable grandmother. But I would argue that we all should remember the name Frances, Frances Kelly, because she was a great woman and she deserves to be in our genealogy of great Britons. Thank you very much.